Welcome everybody to another uh, builder interview. Uh, today I'm with uh, Jonathan Silverblood of uh, General Protocols. How are you doing today, Jonathan? I'm doing just fine. Thank Very you. Very good. So can you introduce yourself briefly? Just uh, tell us, you know, your name and, and a little bit about what you do uh, in Bitcoin Cash. All right. So my name is Jonathan Silverblood. I came to Bitcoin in 2013 at the earliest, uh, but didn't really apply myself. And after the Bitcoin Cash split in, say, 2018, early 2018, uh, I decided to jump in full time and Either it would work or it would break and I'll try something else later. Uh, today, I'm working at General Protocol as the lead developer and I'm building uh, the AnyHedge uh, volatility or stability platform. Cool. And so tell us a little more, like uh, I recently did an interview with uh, Roscoe and he gave us a little bit of information about any hedge, but uh, you know how 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 do you describe you know how it works or what 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 purpose what utility it'll provide? Right. So from my perspective, uh, any hedge is a uh, risk uh, trading platform. So specifically, the risk it works with is volatility risk when prices goes up or down. The first. Uh, launch of the product is going to be based on US dollars versus Bitcoin cash. So it's going to mitigate or allow you to sell and trade the uh, price volatility risk of Bitcoin cash. But technically, the contract isn't limited to cryptocurrencies specifically. Uh, it can actually work with any volatility risk as long as you have the required price source and counterparties for the contract. Cool. So what, how do you envision people uh, using this in the real world? What problems do you think that they, they will want to solve with this? So on the short term, it's probably going to look mostly like a speculative instrument for people who want to gamble on the price going up or down. But on a longer term, it might be used automatically inside your wallet without you ever knowing it, so that when you receive money, it automatically no longer uh, changes value. Like it, it stays stable. Mm -hmm. So you think it'll be... Uh... I also envision... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, I also envision how payment processors and merchants uh, might use it for the very same purpose. Uh, they accept like any... Um, they accept Bitcoin Cash as a cryptocurrency for payment, but as soon as they pay, instead of trying to sell it on the open market in order to get stability. They can just enter it into a contract and they keep the value, but they stay in the BCH ecosystem. In particular, for payment processors, uh, you generally speaking, like the, the main value of a payment processor is that it allows you to take on some of the tasks you don't want to do yourself. And for many merchants, that is the volatility problem. Uh, a payment processor allows you to automatically sell so that you get stable funds. But in some regions of the world, payment processors do not have a good market to sell to, or they might have regulation that prevents them from actually selling because laws might dictate they're not allowed to. And in those markets, you can still build payment processors that offer the service if they're using the NH contract as, a, uh, as their volatility mitigation tool. Very nice. So how do you guys, do you guys have plans to build up uh, liquidity, you know, so that there's enough, um, you know, enough market participants to make this, these, these use cases a reality? So we have a multi-pronged approach here. Our first attempt is going to be focused around splitting up the business into a core business that does not provide liquidity and partners that do. Uh, but going forward after that, if we cannot make or find partners that are able to provide the liquidity necessary, then we will focus on a more peer-to-peer -peer approach and try to find a, a social or a network solution to the liquidity problem. Should that fail uh, to reach significant scale on the local level, because the skill is going to be split apart into the various social circles that, that it involves, uh, we might take a look at uh, federated liquidity, uh, that is building something like a protocol that allows anyone to provide liquidity 
and allows any other party uh, to, to access that liquidity. It's significantly more complex, uh, but it also allows decentralized solutions for, for mitigation uh, of volatility. So you don't need a payment processor specifically to do the mitigation. You could just have a payment terminal and the terminal itself is aware of the available liquidity and uh, hedges for you automatically without the third party involved in the process. Mm. Yeah, I think the decentralized, you know, having observed liquidity uh, for a while, I think decentralized is probably going to be the way to go because, you know, as all of these uh, different nation states, especially in the diff developing world, kind of come online to the reality of cryptocurrency, their first instincts are to, to clamp down and, you know, close bank accounts and whatnot. And that, uh, or, you know, like, for example, here in Colombia, the Buddha exchange was run out of the country a couple of years ago and is just now starting to rebuild uh their 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 user base here so what there's definitely mm -hmm. there's definitely trade-offs to each of these approaches and we are currently targeting the the low-hanging fruit uh by finding partners who are willing to provide uh liquidity and to build platforms around that uh we take the first step but as you say, uh, going forward on the long term, it may very well end up being that we need to build some kind of federated liquidity so that it's global. Hmm. Yeah, I think it'd be re also really interesting just on the general peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, buying and selling front is if uh, there could be, uh, you know, we could share liquidity, you know, so Zapit has, um, you know, a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, buying and selling a marketplace for Bitcoin Cash local.bitcoin.com and uh you know surely others uh are going to be launching uh you know in 2021 and it'd be really interesting if there was a way for uh, liquidity to be shared among those platforms you know f so that uh yeah we yeah. can have the maximum uh you know and and maybe somebody in you know uh zimbabwe for example wants to start uh you know marketing a service uh, to people there, and they he could plug into that that liquidity uh, somehow, or plug his liquidity into so, the global thing. So it's worth mentioning that when we're talking about liquidity in the terms of any hedge, there is one unit of account, but there is only one token. So while we are looking at it uh, based on, for example, the U.S. dollars in terms of the value. Uh, the only actual value that is transferred was used in the contract is Bitcoin Cash. So someone who is in Zimbabwe can participate in liquidity as long as he has Bitcoin Cash. It doesn't matter what bank accounts he has or what background he has otherwise. The only thing that matters is that he has Bitcoin Cash and he wants to uh, provide that for liquidity. Uh, our current partner, DToken, um, they are going to act as a liquidity provider, but from my understanding, they're also going to provide uh, value to the, the maker market by allowing other parties to be liquidity providers on their platform. And I'm not entirely sure how this setup is going to look yet because I haven't seen that part of it. But from my understanding, it would mean that if you're in Zimbabwe and you have a lot of money in Bitcoin Cash, and you want to provide liquidity, then you might not need to wait for that global federated liquidity that works everywhere. You might just be able to go to a uh, uh, third party service and get paid to provide that liquidity to be a maker in that market. Okay, though how, how centralized is DToken? You know, what if somebody wants to shut down DToken? Because I, I think our, our, our liquidity oh. really has to be you know, super decentralized in order to, to to be resilient, you know, in the coming years. So I, I agree that uh, in order to be resilient, you need to have uh, not a single point of failure. Like a single point of failure is not the definition of resilience. DToken, uh, they are a non-custodial platform, but they are not a decentralized platform. Uh, they are a, a single uh, third party and they could be targeted by regulation or similar. Uh, that said, the token is not the only platform that can work with any hedge. They're just the first platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Cool. I mean, and, and it's definitely a huge step forward. You know, is there is there a day a date uh, for for this to launch? You know, tentative or anything? So sadly, we have had multiple missed deadlines for a variety of reasons. So I'm not going to give you a date. Uh, but I will say it's very, very, very soon. Okay, awesome. So, what what are your priorities, you Jonathan? You know, for uh, building on Bitcoin Cash in twenty one. You know, what are you working on? Uh, what what are your interests for the next year? Right. So my interests are quite diverse, but if I were to group them, I would say that it's a matter of uh, adoption and usability. And they go kind of hand in hand. Now, my my personal interest uh, comes on the user side. Uh, what services can you offer to an actual user that would be something that you use like day to day, every day? And one of the problems in the ecosystem right now is that we have no recurring payments that are actually in use. Like we have the Mycenaeus plugin for the Electron Cash Wallet and Jason Dreisheimer made the Cash Channels, which is a recurring payment platform. But neither of them really matches the needs of a user. Like take this for example, say, say you want to step a Netflix subscription and you want to pay in Bitcoin Cash and for some reason they do accept Bitcoin Cash and they do use one of these uh, platforms. Now, on the first day, you would say like, I'm gonna pay $10 every month. And the first month, you're going to pay those $10 because it's on the same day. But a month later, the price have moved. And your channel isn't necessarily aware of that. So you might pay $11 the next month or 9 And you, you can't really be Netflix and have that because it's not a stable operation. So I want to make sure that recurring payments is something that will function for us. But it needs to function on the needs, with the needs for the user. It needs to work with the users, like both the users and the service providers. So we need to upgrade our payment infrastructure to handle recurring payments. And we need to do so so that it functions with fiat currencies as the denominator. Mm -hmm. uh, to do that, we're going to need to have some kind of price information that we can feed into the system. And as part of the work on general protocols and building the infrastructure stack for uh, the NHedge uh, contract platform, uh, we have built a price oracle for US dollars uh, that is live and in production today, um, that is open and public for use. And I would love to find more uses for that, like making it part of recurring payments. Hmm. I can uh, go into other things I'd like to do. Uh, I want to build a wallet. Uh, I've been wanting to build a wallet for years now, actually, that hides every single technical identifier uh, that is in the system, like every single one of them. Uh, you should never, ever need to hear anything technical. There should be no addresses. There should be no weird backup uh, words you need to take care of. There should be no, um, like you, you can scan a QR code, but you know, it should just say scan. It doesn't need to say QR code. Um, and you should have it connected so that it works on your friend list or, or your contact list in your phone. Uh, and if a person is not a contact, it should work on some payment alias like cash account, so using names to send to. Uh, the backup part process of it should be ridiculously simple. Uh, either it should just automatically back up to the cloud, and which it's not the most secure mm -hmm. way to do it, but it's something that will actually happen and it will keep people from losing their money. Uh, or uh, another way to backup that I'm personally a fan of is NFC backups, uh, where you just hold a card to your phone. Uh, it, it vibrates for a short moment to tell you it's done and there you have your backup in your hand. You can apply physical security to it. You can lock it in a case or you know, bury it in your backyard. Um, there's also a handful of services that normal payment infrastructure has that Bitcoin Cash doesn't. Uh, for example, most banks, when they give you your credit card, uh, they set it so that it only functions in the nation you live in, which means that if someone figures out how to hack your card and they live in some far off place, 
your bank gets says no because you are not in that place so that shouldn't be mm-hmm. you. Uh, and you, you can successfully build that in Bitcoin Cash uh, by using a multi-sig two of two where you as an owner, you own both keys, but you give one of the keys over to a third party service which you pay for their service because otherwise they're not incentivized to do a good job. And what they do then is that one of the keys you have in your wallet and the other key you have outside your wallet, like for example, in a bookshelf at home or something. Then whenever you need to do a transfer, you sign for your half of it and the other service does this basic checking like, does this seem to be like the user is coming from the right place or is it within the bounds of the size? Like, is it one of the less than those five thousand dollars a month or something? Um, and after it has looked at and made these sanity checks, it just either agrees to it and the transaction goes out, or it disagrees with it and you get a message that states that your service provider, whom you are paying to prevent you from losing money, like to give you the security, uh, have actually said that they are not willing to take on the risk of this one. You can still send it though. All you have to do is take up your other key, the backup mm-hmm. key that could be an NFC card, hold it to your phone and voila, the transfer is sent because it's still your money. Um, That way the other party does not hold custody. They cannot initiate or send money on your behalf, but you allow them the the ability to protect your funds. Mm. Um, That is one service that exists in normal banking and doesn't exist in in Bitcoin Cash that I would also like to see implemented. I think that's that's a very interesting idea because um... Some people, especially, uh, see the 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 paradigm with banking is that whatever happens with your access or whatever, you can just go with your government issued ID card and get access again to your bank account. And uh, I think it would be right good so to have something. I like have that. to interfere. Yeah, what's, go ahead. Yeah, I have to interfere because that's not right. Uh, in most cases, yes, but for example, if your bank goes bankrupt, it doesn't matter how much you waive your identity. Like you can go with the identity card, but if it's if the funds of the bank is like currently held up in judicial processes, then your funds is locked up. But if you have this two of two system where you own both keys, but allow someone else to provide these services for you, if they go bust or if they stop providing you with that service, you just bring out your other key and you own your money. It's still yours. Although there's deposit insurance schemes, right? Uh... And and governments right, bank are, bail out banks, it, although I'm no defender of banks. <laughs> but what I'm saying is people true, are true, used yeah. to that paradigm where they don't have to worry about protecting access to their money, you know, because also bank bank failures are, are pretty are fairly exceptional these days. Um, so I think I so agree. I think that that, you know, it, it would be nice if we could, you know, there could exist a company or a service or an industry like what you're describing where um you know they did kind of the the risk uh risk assessment and uh where you know if you can actually talk to a human being if you know let's say you back up your key let's say you forget your you lose your your recovery phrase you uh you know you lose your wallet you lose your nfc card and let's say you backed it up to your Google account, uh, you know, like it is uh, now in the Bitcoin.com wallet, and you forget your login to your Google account, uh, which is very possible, very possible. I, I've onboarded thousands of people, and they they lose things, and they forget things, and they have a bajillion uh, Google accounts. And so I think it would it, it is going to be important what you are describing, uh, you know, something like that, in order to really... Uh, approach, um, you know, a serious mass adoption strategy. So, so we know with certainty that there is demand for this kind of services. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist and exist in profitable businesses. And the banks today, whether you like them or not, are profitable businesses and they offer services for a reason. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. It would be good to have more of these kind of services that makes accessing and using cryptocurrency uh, not only be safer but absolutely feel safer Mm. as well because a lot of people who look at cryptocurrency they don't want to touch it because it's foreign to them it's different it's something they are not aware of the paradigm is um, it doesn't match their assumptions like 
there are so many weird parts about cryptocurrency to the average person. Uh, for example, like why do we have eight decimals in our numbers? Mm -hmm. Like you, you can't enter eight decimals in a payment terminal. So what is this weird thing? And um, the the payment addresses. We have had something similar in terms of bank accounts having bank account numbers, but numbers are humane and they are understandable. People realize like they are there for the bank to like keep track of things. It's, it's no, no questions asked about bank account numbers, but if you show someone like an address, they, yeah, it, it's not at all uh, intuitive. I agree 100%. Although I'm not sure that I would want to completely hide them in in you know in wallets at this stage you know maybe maybe 10 years down the road because i think people still need to understand you know and ha also have the option to copy that you know and 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 share it and whatnot so so there are two things here uh the first is that when i say hide uh, i don't mean remove them from existence rather than not uh, what i mean is not having them prominently displayed so if you look at your transaction history, I don't want any addresses listed there. But if you look at a specific transaction, then it's okay to have some technical identifiers there, but you have to like drill down, like do two steps, mm -hmm. like look in the history, look at the specific transaction, get transaction details. Oh, there they are. Uh, because it's important for customer support and for uh, finding out when things go wrong, how to resolve mm -hmm. them. Uh, Otherwise, you, you end up with people saying, like, my transaction didn't work. And people say, yeah, but can you tell us what transaction was? No, it just says my transaction didn't mm. work. Uh, and those kind of error messages aren't really helpful. Mm. Yeah, maybe, uh, you know, it's analogous to, for example, email. You know, uh, an email, you know, we look at it in, a, in an email app and we just see, you know, to, from, date, uh, subject, and the text. But... You know, in yeah. many apps, you can go in, you can say, look at source, and it'll show us all the headers and whatnot. Um, maybe that's analogous to what you're you're suggesting. Yes, it, it cool. is. So, um, you know, I think an important topic uh, after, you know, the, the 15th of November 2020 network upgrade, and, you know, now that we're uh, less than two weeks away from a new year, uh, potentially a new start. Uh, for uh, Bitcoin Cash, what what does Bitcoin Cash need in 2021? You know, what what do you think of the say the top three things that really the ho the whole ecosystem needs to be thinking about and working on uh, in the new year? All right. So for 2021, what Bitcoin Cash needs is entrepreneurs and people who develop businesses. Uh, we need people who build use cases and who drive demand for, for the currency. There are things outside of this that would fit more into the idea of protocol development that would be very beneficial for us to have, but currently those are not the things that are preventing us from growing, getting network effect and becoming more valuable. Hmm. Do you want me to talk about some of the things that I would like to see from a technical sure. standpoint? Sure. All right. Then, then I actually have a laundry list, and it's quite long. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with the native introspection part. So currently today, a transaction can, can be made restricted so that money can only be paid under certain conditions. But the conditions available are very, very limited. And some time ago, uh, we got a new opcode that allowed us to verify signatures outside of a transaction. Like We bring data in, and we verify the signature for it. And one of the things you can do with that is that you can build up the transaction itself and verify the signature for it. And if you do that, then you have all the parts the transaction consists of that is used to build it up, or many of the parts at least. And you can trust that those parts are correct because the signature uh, didn't fail. This allows you to do things like any hedge, the contract, uh, but you can also do a lot of different uh, non-custodial services and tools on top of it. Uh, the problem with it is that it's mostly a hack mm -hmm. today. It's not very clean. It takes up a lot of space and it's, well, as long as we don't have many transactions, it's not a big cost for the network. But say, for example, that uh, recurring payments would become like the norm, like 
everyone had like a handful of recurring payments and the network would actually mm -hmm. scale, then suddenly you would have a very large number of transactions on the network who uses this hack, which is expensive, and it would actually represent some kind of uh, significant strain on the network. There is uh, work undergo undergone, uh, this work underway, uh, to provide native introspection, that is to allow the scripting engine itself to provide this data so that you don't need to build it up from scratch and verify the signature. This has many benefits. For example, we can bring out only the data that we need. In the hacky way, we need to bring up all the data that is part of the transaction uh, signing scheme. Uh, but if we can have a native version, then we can just ask for something like, how big is the payment output? And we will get that data and we can work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, benefit of this is that we could get to data that might not be available with the hacky workaround because the hacky workaround only provides the data that is part of a signing mechanism. And it wasn't intended for this, but a native version could provide more data. The third big value of this is that it reduces the friction and cost of development dramatically. It reduces the risk of error and it makes uh, this kind of introspection on contracts or transactions actually accessible to most developers rather than the very few who have spent a very long time really digging down into this in order to build something. So is this related to the 64-bit integer uh, proposal or is this? It has, it's a separate mm -hmm. proposal, but um, they are both scripting engine changes and they provide for different use cases, uh, but the 64-bit is second on my wish list, um, mostly because it allows for uh, adding multiplication to the protocol in a convenient mm -hmm. way. Uh, currently, we can uh, we can add, subtract, and divide, but we can't multiply on a protocol level. And for a new programmer who might be like the next Steve Jobs and have a great idea on what he wants to build, but who might not be that very techy geek who who really understands math that well, um, not being able to do something as basic as multiplication, that, that it can really stump mm -hmm. you. So today. Uh, the NIH protocol uh, uses things that would naturally have used multiplication, and we spend about a third of our contract working around the issues of the size of the integers and the lack of uh, available mass in it. Hmm. So is your the number one thing on your to-do list, does that have a name? Or what do you call that? Just scripting engine enhancements or...? Or just adding multiplication? Well, native introspection. It, right, native introspection oh, okay. is what I call okay. one of them. Mm -hmm. And there's going to come an article on this in the, the next week or, or the week after or so uh, to really dig down into the health and why. Uh, but, but for now, just, just know that there are some prominent people who have looked into this. And for example, uh, Jason Dreisimer, uh, who previously worked at mm -hmm. BitPay, uh, he has this lib auth library, which re-implements the scripting engine uh, as part of a JavaScript library for use uh, when, when building mm -hmm. tools. And uh, he has built code to do native introspection that functions in his library, but does not function on the Bitcoin Cash network because it's only locally implemented. You can see this as something like a, a start, starting point or some testing version of it. Uh, Andrew Stone from Bitcoin mm -hmm. Unlimited uh, has also uh, implemented native introspection. He has done so on a test net that he runs. So it's quite far along, but there's still many open questions about what the best way to implement it is. Um, think of the DAA upgrade that we recently mm -hmm. had. Like for years, we knew that we need a better DAA, mm. right? And many people give reasonably good answers for what the good outcome would be. But it took a significant amount of research and testing and community discussion before we actually reached the point where we implemented it. And I don't want to push for something that doesn't meet the same requirements. So when it comes to native introspection, we're, we're past the starting point. 
uh, there's a lot more work to do to make it really meet that high requirement that we should have on including things into the mm -hmm. protocol. So is native introspection a consensus change? Okay. Yes. It, it adds a couple of new uh, opcodes to the okay. protocol. That means that all node developers need to implement it in the nodes, and there's a bunch of libraries affected and some other okay. things. So what is the process? Do you see a process today for um, you know changing the protocol? Because I'm seeing several people say you know who have different proposals say, I have no idea what the process is now. Right. So so I'll preface this by saying that this is a something that isn't worked out yet. We we don't really know what the process is, but we have always had a process. It's just unknown. Like Bitcoin upgrades when Bitcoin upgrades, mm -hmm. right? And we can dress it up however we want. But if we if people don't want an upgrade, it's it's not going to happen. Now, what I would like to see going forward, and and why I'm even talking about the subject, is that I would like to see uh, more value created and less value destroyed. Mm -hmm. And the upgrade process or the upgrades that we've had in the past have several of them been quite damaging. So from that perspective, uh, what I would like to see is much longer lead times. Like when something is ready, that's good. Then I want it, but I don't want it tomorrow. When it's ready, I want everyone to know about it. I know everyone to see it. I want strong peer review. I want a test net. And after that, I want like six to nine months of just empty lead time for it to get boring, for people to uh, have debates, for people to be angry and stop being angry, for people to test it and for builders to build on it before it actually makes it into the protocol. This is in quite stark contrast to the uh, de facto process we've had recently, where you had three months before a hard fork point, you had to, you know, in those days is the last time to spec something up, and several of the actual things we've had were specced up like on or after that feature freeze. And then in just a few, few months, they expect, or, or people have expected that all that uh, strong research, peer-to-peer, uh, review and all that is supposed to happen and settle down on an agreement while people still have other things they want to do in their mm -hmm. lives. So, so three, three months is, is ridiculously short. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mind at all if we upgrade often, but I don't want anything into the protocol that hasn't been ready and then just had a long lead time after. Mm -hmm. So do you think you know, so one concern here, you know, maybe the whole uh, six month, uh, you know, hard fork thing uh, from before, you know, it sounds like maybe uh, from your point of view, it was trying to push things uh, a little too fast. And so maybe the end result was fewer things of value happened. Um, and so. Well, I think more things of value happened because it was reckless. Mm. But I also think that the value lost outweighs the value gained. And how was the value lost precisely in your, you know, what caused value to be lost, you know, from your perspective? Well, let's just say that one of the better up and coming wallets that we had was Handcash and it moved to Satoshi's vision and Sentby moved to Satoshi's vision. And as much as I don't really like the current version of yours.org, uh, what it was back then was really impressive, and it moved to BSV. And they're not the only examples. BSV has a lot of entrepreneurial spirit behind it, a lot of people who want to build businesses and make money. And we would have had all those, uh, all that enthusiasm and all those workers would have been on the same chain if we hadn't split it. And the latest split with Bitcoin ABC uh, has led to the, well, for lack of a better word, loss uh, of some developers who have been influential and have been making things uh, that, that fits user needs. Um, for example, uh, Tobias Rust, uh, who is building BE.cash, uh, he is building for real use cases. And 
I kind of wish that he was still with it. Uh, he's he's on the ABC side, as far as I understand it now. Um, Vin Armani is also one of those who spent a lot of time, put in a lot of effort, and he may talk much, but he also work much. Uh, from my perspective, uh, while context as a service wasn't for me because I live in a, a modern first world country and I have other ways to transfer money that is more convenient to me. Uh, it's actually something that I believe has potential and he is looking into many gambling related use cases and gambling is a huge, huge market uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. So. Those are two people who, who left for, for ABC, and that's lost, lost potential in terms of uh, workers. There's also a lot of speculators mm -hmm. that have moved. We have, we have lost network effect because we split down into smaller, smaller social mm -hmm. circles. And every time we push a contentious issue, we also damage relationships between the people involved because they don't feel valued they feel overrun or um, poorly treated when they try to raise concerns, but the timing is too short, we have to do this anyway, or, or some mm -hmm. such. Uh, so yeah, I, I believe the, the splits and the upgrades we've had so far has been quite damaging. Mm. Although, you know, um, I think that the, the whole uh, ABC thing, I don't think that they were lost because of the A, because of, you know, any schedules, um, you know, from what I saw, it was all about the narrative. It was all about, um, you know, the group uh, thinking that, co that coalesced in, in ABC. Um, whereas I can see, you know, so, like, for example, with the case of SV, um, you know, that, you know, I think, uh, you know, the upgrade schedule and the changes proposed were there, they did play a large role. So I can see how you come to such conclusions and I consider them possible and valid, but I don't think they paint the whole picture. I think there's a lot more to it. And I think that if we could go back in time and do things differently, we could have different outcomes. I don't think this was inevitable, the outcomes we've had. Yeah, I don't know. In the case of ABC, I, I feel like, um, you know, Amori was dead set on his, I mean, <laughs> but a week before he announced it, I was, I was, I spent hours trying to, 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 to talk him onto another path. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about that, but, um, but yeah, so you, so do you think that, you know, with a longer lead time that we may actually be able do you think that our, our results, our forward progress will suffer at all? Or do you think that it will be more, more productive in the end? All right. So I'm going to say something controversial here, and this is going to be fun. Do you remember that time when Bitcoin Cash uh, split from BTC and the SegWit 2x upgrade failed the 2x part? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in the about two to three years leading up to that, uh, something happened in the Bitcoin space that I didn't see at the time because I was way too ingrained into the way of my thinking. But we actually hit the scaling issues and people were underserved. In particular, the people who wanted to use Bitcoin for payments were underserved. They had bad experiences. They got stuck in, in, in backlogs. They paid higher fees than mm -hmm. normal. And as someone who's strongly enthusiastic and really saw the potential of Bitcoin, I didn't really see the effect that this would have on the actual users. Because from my perspective, this was all problems to be solved. And we were talking about them and trying to work with them. But in reality, if you have a user group and then you serve it poorly for years and years on end, those users walk away, mm. right? They disappear. They, they're not gonna stay there for three years and support your cause, no matter how noble you think it is. Because if it doesn't work out well for them, you know, they'll find something else that does. So if you look at the, uh, 
the scheduling and the lead times. If you have a controversial issue and you schedule it to happen nine months from now, and it's still controversial when you schedule it, then you have nine months to not provide good service to user and make those users go away. And this is a cynical viewpoint, but it might actually make it so that they go away slowly and silently and in a decentralized way. And when the upgrade comes, you don't split. The network stays intact. And it might be that those users had a different vision than what you had from the beginning, but you will come out stronger afterwards because you don't have the, the, the hatred and the, the loss that comes with a very contentious single time event. So the strategy here is to wait them out. <laughs> you, you could say that. Um, I, I wouldn't call it a strategy. I wouldn't call it as intentional as maybe I sounded when I explained it, but more like recognizing that this is one of the effects of having a long lead time. It is that the people who are not content with what is about to happen, instead of rallying up an army and fighting you, they leave and you have less contentious people to 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 cause a negative mm. effect so here, here's something to think about though one thing i'm concerned about you know for example uh amory and anthony and jason etc they they're they're in unique that's a unique situation those are people who are highly capable of of of, of running their own blockchain and they know lots of people and so that 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 kind of fork can be taken seriously, you know, by some. But not just anybody can do that, right? That's one reason why uh, blockchain engineers are in such high demand and can be paid so well is because really it's there's not a lot of them. So, you know, one thing I'm concerned about is that we are going to uh, keep fighting the last war, and we're going to slow things down in an attempt to avoid a, a repeat of, you know, the whole ABC thing, when in reality, is there, you know, is there really anybody else that has the will and the skill to, uh, to do what ABC did, you know, in, in, in the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem now? I'm, there are people who have the skill, but I'm not sure there's anybody who has the will. Right, so I can answer that question with a uh, very strong and resounding yes, there are. Uh, at very minimum, uh, there is multiple nodes in our ecosystem that has actual teams behind them who are willing to work for, for what they're doing. Uh, how far they would be willing to take it, I don't know. Uh, but also, I don't think we are in a position where that might even have a chance to play out because from where i'm sitting uh, all of the current node developers for all of the current nodes they are actively communicating and talking mm -hmm. with each other so and, and we're they're, they are taking real care to make sure that it's more of an inclusive environment and that we don't have um anyone who sits in a position of power to the point where it's mm. damaging. Mm. All right. Well, um, I think this has been a great conversation, Jonathan, and uh, I really appreciate your time uh, and, you know, this opportunity to speak with you. Do you want to uh, get in any final words, let people know where to contact you, anything that you want help with, uh, you know, or people to contact you about? So, uh, in the spirit of uh, like, if you repeat something enough times, it will actually happen. Uh, I'd like to say that we have a problem with our um, with our unit, right? We have this Bitcoin Cash BCH unit, and we have our satoshis and we have our bits and millis and whatnot. But the only actual defined unit we have is the BCH unit, and it's not a valid. Uh, ISO standardized unit as a currency unit, 
which means that it doesn't really fit into some sales and accounting software. And the eight decimal points that we have, um, it doesn't really work out. Like users don't want to input or even see numbers that start with five decimals. It's it's not relevant for them. And we have we have the opportunity to actually do something about it and therefore grow adoption. Uh, many people have suggested that we change the unit and that we adopt some other unit. And I don't think that's a viable way forward. Uh, but I do think that we should talk with each other and try to come to an agreement on a formalized name, ticker, and whatnot for the unit that we already have, specifically the Satoshis and the bits or cash or whatever you want to call the unit that is 100 Satoshis. Because if we do get a, a ISO compatible unit code like XCH or something like that, and we do get zero or no decimals, then suddenly we are actually compatible with sales and accounting. And believe it or not, what we want and what we want to bring to our ecosystem is companies. We want to bring people with profit motive who are able to build use cases. So let's not make it difficult for them. Let's try to make it so that it's as easy as possible to, to have a business in Bitcoin Cash. Hmm. Yeah, I find that, that proposal very interesting. And I, I would definitely like to see more people uh, discussing it. And I'm, I'm interested to, to work on uh, making it happen. Right. No uh, All right. Well, yeah. thanks. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, you know, hope you have a nice uh, holiday season. And uh, let's keep building Bitcoin Cash.